what, like the show. I mean, you have to check it yeah, out. Yeah, I've, I've been watching some of the episodes. Do, do you find the questions inter- interesting and deep? Because I do when they ask each other about their boundaries and what they look in a partner and stuff like that. Like, I have to write down this and like interview myself because I don't know the answers of like, I don't know, half of these questions, you know? <laughs> so yeah. It's just like, wow. I mean, they make it for the fun and also the love, but it's... No, really- I was talking about your show. Ah! Like, yeah, I've not watched their episodes. <laughs> <laughs> you watched my show <laughs> yeah i was watching a few episodes over the weekend because oh. i was trying to i always do that before i'm also i also subscribe because it's like let's see <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much hey. nice to meet you finally <laughs> yes finally <laughs> How are you feeling, by the way? Much better, much better. I had my whole face hurting on the right side because of the cold wind, but mm-hmm. you know, it's sunny. And I'm like, oh, I don't need a hat. And then it's like, oh, why everything is like in pain? And then oh, I was like, no. mm-hmm. yeah, sensitive stuff. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I surprisingly always fall sick around this time, even last year. Like so it's it's not a cold, but my allergies just act up like crazy. Oh, so I see. It, what yeah. is the most common symptom that you get in? You know, like it's over. I'm I'm going to be sick now. It's my throat. My throat oh. just starts acting up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, my throat is still not completely back to normal. So my voice is my dad says I'm sounding like Amitabh Bachchan. He's a Bollywood actor who has a very deep voice. So, <laughs> yeah, just a riot. <laughs> what an interesting comparison. Like, you sound like a Bollywood actor. That's what he said? Yeah, like, uh, so he's very famous for his very deep voice. Uh-huh. Uh, so he's just been, say, like, repeating and everything I say in an Amitabh Bachchan accent. You should look him up after um okay. after our conversation yep. yeah yeah please send me the name so i can compare it yes i later. will <laughs> no so, it's, it's just my dad making fun of me <laughs> oh i love it i love it so we already have started i if you don't mind i can include all this chit chat in the beginning <laughs> Yeah. yeah, whatever works for you. <laughs> yeah, I would just cut it up nicely and properly, but you know, it's it's natural and I think people will like it more when hear like a conversation like that when not when we're like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I yeah, this is my favorite kind of podcast, even though technically this is only my third ever one. So <laughs> third one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um I'm happy to hear afterwards what is your feedback and if you have any suggestions later, but we shall see how it goes. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Great. So I have a question. Yes. How do I pronounce your name? Is it Nicoletta? Like just perfect. Correct. Perfect. Oh, how, okay. However, however it rolls on your tongue, just say mm-hmm. it how you feel like it. It it doesn't matter. Uh, you cannot go wrong. I mean, there's no extra letters. There's no, there's nothing <laughs> to sing or adding. So it's just how you see it. And you you're just Maria. <laughs> yeah, just Maria. Maria. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, my first question was like an icebreaker that I always forget to ask people who I who I meet like for the first time, and I'm like. Why did I put it in the whole uh, introduction and I never (laughs) asked it? But now I remember and I'm like, let me see. Okay. First thing in the morning when you wake up. Very serious questions. Do you make your bed first or do you go around your routine or do something else and then come back to it and fix it? So I'm not a morning person. So I first go to the bathroom and then I fix up my bed. But I always fix up my bed. Okay. Okay. That's that's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I ask this because most of entrepreneurs have like some kind of uh, discipline about them in small habits, which translates later into their working style and, you know, the way they present themselves. And I find that most of people do stand up like from the bed do their you know bathroom routine and then Mm -hmm. come back and fix it and continue with their day because I have friends that they don't do their bed first thing in the morning (laughs) so I'm like is there some kind of correlation between the two but it's still ongoing research so yeah 
And if you have more questions, you can ask them uh, during the podcast. I don't know why nobody so far asked me anything. <laughs> oh, well, I'll ask you, do you make your bed? Yeah, of course. It's made right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe you made it for the podcast. We don't know, right? Well, I never I never have it undone because uh, this is my only uh, studio. Uh, like, this is the whole mm -hmm. room that I'm living in. So if it's messy, it's messy here and I cannot. Yeah. I just cannot. Yeah. How would you introduce yourself for somebody that doesn't know you, who you are and what you do? For example, in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so hi, everyone listening. My name is Maria, and I write websites for a living. So essentially, I have to say it because when I say copywriter, they assume it's something to do with copyright law, which is an interesting field, but definitely not what I'm doing. Okay. Essentially, the words on your website, like your homepage, about sales page, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's what I do for a living. Okay, do you like also writing for blogs or you're more focused on like web pages? So I actually started freelancing back in 2018, although mm -hmm. that's a very loose way of putting it across because the first, I think, nine months, I didn't get a single paid client and I started with blogs. So mm -hmm. I started with blogs and then I did a bunch of things over the years before finding copywriting as like the thing I do now oh so do you remember your first client where did did you find them and how was the first experience it's a very funny story so uh I was really struggling to get clients I think this was the, it had reached December of 2018 mm -hmm. and at that time the movie Aquaman had released okay and I essentially told myself I'm not going to see this movie without my own money because I had no money at the time mm -hmm. I was really broke mm -hmm. um, and I was living in my grandparents back in India so okay. I was like I'm not asking my grandfather for money to go see a movie yeah and uh, it was a really big struggle but finally I think when the movie was just about to get out of the theater I mm -hmm. got my first client through Craigslist oh my which God. is yeah it was a surprising thing because I sent hundreds of pitches, cold emails. Uh, mm -hmm. I got rejected from Upwork 11 times before I got in on my 12th time. Oh my and God. it's so funny. Everything just clicked in that one week. That first day I got in through Craigslist. Mm -hmm. The second day I got approved on Upwork. And in the on the third day, I got two clients of Upwork. So after months of no clients, yeah. like in one week, I got three clients, which is absolutely crazy. So in, in today's chapter that I read in my book, the, the title was about uh, how to do a website audit, but it says timing is everything. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Timing is everything, about everything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is how in one week you found your first client and you uh, had your uh, profiles approved. But what do you mean approved? They didn't uh, let you in on the platform or yeah they didn't let me in on the platform because so I'm from India and uh -huh. there's a lot of perceptions about Indians in the freelancing world which is very unfortunate yeah um so the thing is Upwork is very strict when it comes to Indians on the platform especially when it comes to writing so mm -hmm. because there's a lot of blog writers and I've seen it in general with a lot of apps that they're they're pretty stringent when it comes to Indian owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's racism. I don't know if they just want extra policies. Mm -hmm. But um, like, for example, with Stripe, I was literally talking about this on my Instagram, but yeah. Stripe isn't accepting any new Indian businesses until the end of 2025, which oh. is next year. So I got rejected in like a week from Stripe, even though I've been running my business for more than six years now. So yeah. just how it is. Ooh, interesting topic. You know what? It might be because your market by itself, because you're such a big population, it's so huge. Yeah. And the competition among you guys compared to other world is so big. And once you take the market, you take the market, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's so much money. But I also understand it because I understand where they're coming from because mm. there are so many scams happening that one. Um, through yeah. Indians. Mm -hmm. So I get... I get that, but I'm I'm just saying if it's if if there are people like me who have legal yeah. businesses, like they yeah. should 
uh, they should have something in place. But I also understand where they're coming from. So, of course, yeah. yeah. Maybe some kind of filtering uh, that maybe will not be so such a like knee jerk reaction. You know, ah, India, go. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it would be nice to have like I don't know maybe to set up in place some kind of. I don't know questionnaire or interviews or I don't know something that would make it a bit easier for businesses who really want to do business to you know yeah. go to also quick question which book are you reading what which book uh atomic design okay all right I should yeah. look that up yeah it, well it's about creating design systems in the beginning it was not very interesting to read because it was like general stuff and I'm like okay I'm doing websites for such a long time tell me something that I don't know and then straight up jump to something else and I'm like oh okay there's something here to learn <laughs> <laughs> and you do you read something at the moment so I've always been an avid reader mm -hmm. uh, but this year I set out to read 52 books this year <laughs> Fifty <laughs> two, yeah. Because so I'm on this app called Goodreads, and I'm sure there are people. Yes, we should be friends on Goodreads. I'm trying to make more friends, but so. <laughs> but I put like workbooks and other books there, like other books. So. I know which I know which other books you're talking about, and I read those other books as well. Okay, okay, <laughs> perfect. So yeah, I've been on Goodreads for ten years, and. Mm. Since I got on Goodreads, the most I've read in a year is 20. And that was the one year, that was, I think, the pandemic. Mm. So I had more time. Yes. But since becoming an adult, I've lost the reading habit I had as a kid. Mm. I was a kid. I used to hide books in the bathroom. I used mm -hmm. to hide books under my desk. The yeah. teachers didn't know me for anything apart <laughs> as being the girl who read in class. So I was that kind of kid. But I lost that habit. So yeah. This year, I just set out, like, I'm going to read 52 books. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling a bit, I got to admit. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. right now, uh, I alternate between fiction and nonfiction. Right mm -hmm. now, I'm reading a book called Letters from a Stoic by Seneca, which is not the typical kind of book I read, but yeah. um, it's good. Uh, but it's taking me a while to read it. So Dang. I'm on book. This is book 35. So, 35. Yeah. Okay, it's going well then. And this is for the book challenge for the year, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put 24 and I think I'm on 17 or something like that. Oh, that's actually quite good. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. What I do is like I take one self-help book to do it in a slow pace and finish it, finishing it in two months or something like that because those take me a while. And then I take another one that is like a lighter version of like romance or something yeah. And uh, then I read it in two nights or something like this. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's... see, I have like I have so much hatred for people who put down romance. It is these are good books. There are so many good romance books. Tell them. And yeah, like it I feel like it's just that because it's something that a woman likes, mm -hmm. that's why people look down on it. For example, boy bands. I remember how much people used to look down on One Direction, Backstreet mm -hmm. Boys, and now people are so excited about it. N6. What's the song which was in Deadpool? Uh, 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 bye, 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 bye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that song, I'm sure it was hated by like the male population. And now yeah. it's cool because it's in the superhero movie. I love superhero movies, but as you could tell from Aquaman, but yeah. I just think it's, it's just a trend that if some if it's something that a woman likes, it's something that's to be looked down upon. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that happened with Star Trek. And well, I am now digressing from the conversation. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's funny you say that, but I I do kind of understand where you're coming from. But I also like it because it's our thing, and I don't yes. and I don't want it to be like so popular <laughs> and blown up and liked by everybody. But there's now trend on social media, men reading our books, and I'm like, don't spoil this for us please <laughs> just keep your mouth shut <laughs> because we talk about the books but we don't give away what we really talk about yeah. in, in the books but there's like lots of psychology there's lots of uh, real life situations where you can find yourself in the characters the book that I just finished there was a really interesting trauma related to food and love and how the main character really like experienced love through food and when she got fed by her partner she started crying because her mother never loved her in such a caring way and I was like 
yeah, I'm PMSing. I'm gonna cry right now, and and it just happened because it was so well written, you know. So yeah, books make you think, and I just wonder what kind of books did you read when you were little, when you were growing up? Oh my gosh, I have to really think about it. Because I remember when I was in primary school, my favorite author was Edith Blyton. Mm. Um, so like Famous Five, I was obsessed with Famous Five. It was my favorite series. It's it's just about these five kids. I think they're cousins or I'm maybe maybe I'm wrong. And they mm -hmm. like saw all these mysteries or maybe I'm confusing it. Like, But my favorite book growing up was Peter Pan. I was, yes, I was... I read that book front to back so yeah. many times. Yeah. And um yeah, Naughty so boys. I <laughs> Yeah. Man, I've not thought about the books I read as a kid in a long time. So that was that's something to think about for sure. Right. I was a I was a Wattpad kid, so but I got I gotta be honest. <laughs> what but what? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, early? Then, yeah, not not that early. I think uh -huh. when I was like 14 or 15 okay. so okay. yeah no 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 <laughs> not that early <laughs> okay 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 currently traveling what is the reason that you are hopping on so many places share with us I was living um in India until the end of December last year mm -hmm. and there yes. were three things that made me realize that I wanted to travel more so one was my younger sister was getting married in mm -hmm. January of 2024 Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that, oh, wow, you know, life is really changing and it's it really changes. And that realization really settles in when a sibling gets married. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to spend more time with my family. I essentially left home when I was 17 for college mm -hmm. and I hadn't lived with family except that one portion where I was staying with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided that I will travel and also visit and live with my family in pockets of time and spend more time with them because I don't know how long I have. So when I say travel, I'm also traveling to other countries. Like, for example, I was in Vietnam. I was in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also visiting my grandparents in Bombay and Kochi. These are two different cities in India. And also mm -hmm. my parents here in Doha. Okay. Um, and in two weeks, I'm going to the U.S. because I'm going for a conference. I'm going for the Show It conference. Oh, and okay. Yes. Uh, that will be my first professional conference. So let's see how that goes. It but I'm also going to visit family, like my uncle in, mm -hmm. um, in where is he? In Mountain House in California and my sister in San Francisco. So, yeah. So I think it was just the wanting to spend more time with my family and also realizing that all the money that I was spending paying rent and also there are fixed expenses when you're living in one particular city yeah. and I realized I could save that and actually invest that into my business there is no way I could have gone for this conference if I wasn't doing mm. that mm. so that was another thing and then the third thing I, I it mean I realized I was really scared of traveling by myself really so, yes so scared. So this is something you will see very common in uh, kids who grew up in Indian households because mm -hmm. Indian parents tend to be very overprotective. So I was raised in the Middle East. I was raised in Muscat and Dubai. Mm -hmm. And so, but even then, even though my family was outside India, we're really overprotective mm -hmm. of the kids. Mm -hmm. And so there is no such thing as sending uh, the kids on a gap year so there's no such concept in India yeah and I was 27 when I took my first solo trip mm -hmm. so I just got the courage to do it when I made the decision that okay I'm not going to stay in India anymore I'm not going to mm -hmm. stay in one place anymore and I looked at Vietnam as my first trial of it and it was, it was a life-changing trip it was amazing yeah. I want to go back again next year for sure so yeah, yeah all these three things kind of made me want to travel more mm. see 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 but this was like um your first solo trip for fun not not for work not for you know a meeting family or, or this is because no uh -huh. yeah so yeah. this was just uh it was a solo trip for like mm -hmm. two weeks Mm -hmm. and uh it was very scary I still have I filmed myself actually booking my tickets mm -hmm. back when in November of 2023 and I went in January of 2024 yeah. 
and it was just an exhilarating moment because yeah. I thought I would never do this. I've been telling my friends for years, I'm going to go on a solo trip. I'm going to do this. But yeah, um, yeah so you postponed it. Fun. Where did you stay in Vietnam? Was it like a I hostel? Was in, I was in a hostel. Mm-hmm. I was also in a hotel for some places, but mm-hmm. mostly in a hostel. Mm-hmm. And my first time again, it was really fun. I was in Hanoi mm-hmm. and I also went on the cruise in Halong Bay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also went to I went to Khao Bang, which is a city, a town that is mm-hmm. in like eight hours north of Hanoi. Okay. And it's on the border of China. Oh. And when I told people I was going there, nobody <laughs> knew where that was. Hmm. Uh, so the thing is, I just I had like four days. Uh, so I had this itinerary that I'm going to mm-hmm. do all these things. Yes. And I ended up finishing four days ahead of my time. Wow. So I had four days to kill and I did not want to spend more of it in Hanoi. Mm-hmm. So I made the decision to see these beautiful waterfalls that are in Khao Bang. Mm-hmm. And it took me like an eight hour van journey. Wow. And when I reached there, I was the only foreigner. Like, mm-hmm. There were hardly any foreigners there, especially because it's January. Yeah. And yeah, so that was the entire trip. That was <laughs> so would you say that when you go on a trip, you over plan everything? Um, I over plan and also under plan. I leave room for, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. spontaneous trips like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. If we ask three of your closest friends, what is Maria like? What would they say about you? <laughs> So when I got this question, okay, I actually asked three of my friends mm-hmm. and two of them, this is so embarrassing to say out loud, but two of them said that I am the embodiment of sunshine oh. and yeah, which is so nice to yeah. hear from them. Uh, and they tell me that I'm kind, I'm quite adventurous <laughs> because mm-hmm. I'm, the, I'm the person who takes people on the spontaneous, let's go see this restaurant, let's mm-hmm. Uh, let's go for a wine tasting workshop even though I yeah. just heard about it yeah um, and also I guess uh, generous because I'm very generous with mm. my time advice and everything that I can provide okay. giving okay that's nice yeah. but why why did you say embarrassing They're, these are such a great qualities to say about you as a person like why <laughs> I know but I just I feel I'm someone who does not take compliments like I love co- hearing compliments I just don't take them very well uh-huh. so having to repeat what someone else said is I don't know embarrassing to me <laughs> oh. oh okay something to journal <laughs> yes <laughs> and now for as a copywriter do you read or write more I definitely write more mm-hmm. I write so much also because my hobby is writing fiction mm-hmm. so So my hobby, my day job, everything is writing. And then mm-hmm. I have like an hour to read a day. So that's the... The comparison between okay. the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what are you... Uh, are you publishing anything or you're just writing for your own? Or what, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So one day I want to be a published author. So... Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think... Uh... <laughs> Do you also want to write? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. We yeah. should definitely talk about this after. Yes. But yes, so one day in the future, like I'm midway through the current, I've written a lot of manuscripts over the last few years, but mm. I haven't, like the only publishing I've done is back when I was in college and mm-hmm. we were part of a writer's club and together we came and published a collection of short stories. So, yeah. Okay. So you already have like the the pathway to how to create a book right yes uh, but I definitely want to be traditionally published but mm-hmm. I think I think because it's something that takes a lot of time and mental energy because yes. you have to send it off to agents and you have mm-hmm. to get rejected so mm-hmm. that's the whole shebang have you considered being self-published to do no it because um self-publishing involves like so the thing is It would like it would be a repetition of what I went through as a freelancer because mm-hmm. when I went into freelancing, I thought this was just going to be the creative work. I'm just going to do the creative work, but I forgot that there is all the sales and marketing business, and yeah. talking to people, like yeah. actually conducting it as a business. Mm-hmm. And when you self-publish, and this is no absolutely no hate, only love to everyone who self-publishes. Yeah. It's just that you have to take 
dedicate so much of your time to marketing it, investing mm -hmm. in ads, mm -hmm. sending it to book influencers and all mm -hmm. of that. So mm -hmm. it's not something I want to do. Oh, that's the difference then. I thought, okay, I don't, I don't know what I thought. I thought it's just like easier for people to get to read your book when you self-publish it, you know? It's easier for people to read it. And yeah. the people being your audience. So that could be your family, your friends, yeah. and the people... Maybe if you have an Instagram, your Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and also because I don't have an Instagram for my writing. I used I to have see. a website, but yeah. I just, yeah. So that's limited audience means limited books. Mm -hmm. So so just that. So it will make sense first to have a following and then actually promote yes. the book on it as a self-publishing author. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Because also in music now, lots of artists like want to have their own label because I guess also that involves profits and whatnot. So that's why I was wondering, why not self-publish it if you can? It's a great avenue. I know a lot of self-published authors who make so much money. Mm. Uh, like one of my favorite YouTube channels is run by uh, a self-published author. His name is Chris Fox. And mm -hmm. he he publishes, his writing speed is insane. It's yeah. very similar to, uh, I always compare it to Brandon Sanderson, who writes a ton of books at a great, like an incredible speed. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so he talks about the marketing and the costs that go into yeah. because being a self-published author is a full-time job really? where a huge portion of it is dedicated to actually constantly coming up with new books mm -hmm. and then a huge portion of it into admin and similar mm -hmm. to running a business so that's yeah, the whole point. yeah and writing the book itself is so much work yeah so, I, I haven't started but you know I I don't know even in that field how many subcategories that you have to go through until you actually complete the process exactly can you tell me a couple of the steps you went through with your colleagues to publish that uh, stories book so when you're publishing a book on Amazon so this was more than 10 years not 10 years ago but like eight years ago so yeah, long time ago. it's definitely something i have to bring up from memory but thankfully i didn't have to do too much of it yeah <laughs> because one of my friends like co-members she took care of it her mm -hmm. name is swati uh, yeah. she's one of my oldest friends and uh, she essentially designed the book she formatted it which is a huge undertaking in itself because you yeah. specifically format it for Kindle. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, you have to go to the Kindle. It's called KU something. Like okay. there's, a, there's a program on Amazon that allows you to uh, publish through uh, the platform. So mm -hmm. you can just do it yourself without having to bring on external vendors to do it for you. It's okay. just a lot of lot of work I actually have the book yeah really <laughs> like because I was looking for it because I was participating in a writing competition last month the first one I've mm -hmm. done in a while and it was ocean related and I remembered I had an ocean themed story uh -huh. in this so yeah this is these are the two books <laughs> oh, nice. so your name is on the back um in front? It's, it's it's like the our pictures and um that's so cool wait. so you're yeah. already one one step ahead <laughs> you just yeah to surprisingly take your own. my yeah so this is like yeah so you can see look at you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've never talked about this actually before yeah but, it's a fun thing i'm glad that this podcast is the first time you talk about it <laughs> yeah so that's so cool oh my god okay you you were an author already so you just have to make yours your book yeah i'll much. be if you create a new instagram for the book let me know okay <laughs> Yeah, definitely. You have been self-employed for so long. Uh, what other jobs have you done before uh, copywriting as a freelancer? So I've never actually held a full-time job. So when I was in college, I did six internships with mm -hmm. like Fortune 500 companies, really big companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I even did it with Paramount Studios. So yeah. I got a taste of movie marketing. Yeah. And I realized that maybe this isn't right for me right now. Mm -hmm. And I chanced upon freelancing because at the time 
I was unemployed. I was living in my grandparents' house and I was like, what do I do with my life? Yeah. And I found out about this and I I thought, let me just give it a go. So mm-hmm. I first, to get the money for my first website, I designed resumes. So this is not something I talk about is because it's so funny to me because I used Canva to design the resumes because at that time, Mm -hmm. People were really interested in making their resumes look pretty before they realized that, okay, everyone uses like a system to process resumes. So that's not something you should do. Yeah. And my first website was, I think, just under $100. So I got that money. And it's a lot of money in India. It's about 8,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. And so I got my first website. I started uploading blogs one after the other. Mm -hmm. And my first year, I uploaded 18 blogs. Then I got the job as a ghostwriter for blogs. And I realized that all the blogs that I'd uploaded because I'd been studying SEO, Mm -hmm. uh, it made me realize I could actually do SEO. Yeah. So I got a really great uh, job with, not job, like a contract position as an SEO specialist. And I was really good at it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years I've done a bunch I've done editing for reels for Instagram for other people oh my god Um, that's so cool I've also filmed I filmed reels and this is these two were not very not something I did very often the most the thing I did most often was blogs and SEO Mm -hmm. and then three years ago I chanced upon a mentorship with another copywriter it was a paid mentorship so Mm -hmm. essentially she brought me under her wing and I wrote copy for clients and I realized that, wow, this is so fun. Yeah. And because blogs are short term projects, it goes on the website and it's something that you don't really think about months mm. later on. Mm-hmm. It's only important at that moment and also for SEO. But with website copy, like copy I've written for clients even three years ago is still there on their website. So it's something I love seeing. It's I mean, maybe it's an ego thing. I don't know. <laughs> But I just, I feel so great about the fact that I can look at all these websites Mm -hmm. and see how their business has grown and directly kind of attributed to the work that I've done. So directly kind (laughs) of straightforwardly contributed to the work. (laughs) So yeah, that's so cool. When you say, when you mention a pain mentorship, do you, uh, uh, are you now in your career in such stage that you have mentees yourself? I just joined another mentorship actually, because <laughs> I, because even though I've been doing copywriting for three years, it was only last year where I was able to make that full transition because yes. getting copy work is very difficult. I know, uh, especially, especially after AI. Yeah. Mm. And uh, that transition from blog writing to copy was very difficult for me mm-hmm. because blogs is a short-term project and copy is a long-term project. Mm-hmm. And obviously the implications of it are also so different. Yeah. So because I came into this realization over the last three months, I joined a mentorship with um, Sarah Noel from Between the Lines Copywriting. She's one of the best copywriters in the industry. She's uh, she's mainly known uh, among show it designers. So mm, I see um, in that community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I decided to join her mentorship, and it's been about two weeks. I love her. She's fantastic. Yeah, giving great advice. And in terms of mentoring other people, uh, a lot of people have come to me over the years asking for advice, and I'm always happy to give it to them. Yeah. But I've also noticed that they don't do anything after I give the free advice. Mm-hmm. But the only person who did something after, so her name is Lavina Jane. I'll probably yeah. send her this after. Yeah. Uh, so I remember last year I was at a WeWork, and I told her, okay, let's get on call because she asked for a call conversation yeah and I gave her advice and I also realized that she was really good at LinkedIn like mm-hmm. in comparison to me because until last year all of my work came through referrals and I wasn't investing a single cent in uh marketing whether mm-hmm. it was time or money or resources yeah. yeah so in December of last year a few months after we had this conversation I actually hired her Mm. to help me with my LinkedIn yeah so yeah so that way she has been my favorite men- mentee yeah, yeah, um, yeah because I was I saw how the advice I gave her was able to help her mm. and she also helped me because she helped me figure out how to traverse LinkedIn so yeah, yeah. 
that's so cool. That's that's the type of collaboration that we are looking for in this uh, freelance community and online businesses. And it's amazing that you can find someone that you can exchange uh, services with. That's that's great. That's great. Look at you. I'm so happy for you guys. I wonder what will happen afterwards. Yeah, well, we don't work together anymore mm -hmm. uh, because I. So the reason why I hired her was because. I wanted to start posting on LinkedIn and yes. it just felt like the biggest hurdle to climb over. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of it was mental because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a perfectionist and mm -hmm. I made it to a bigger deal than it was. Mm -hmm. So I told, I told her, Hey, can you, can you come on board? Can mm -hmm. you help me figure out how to post on LinkedIn? And can you help me figure out content strategy for a few months? Yeah. And she also edited a lot of my posts. So mm -hmm. Like I, we worked together for like, I think six months, which was a great period of time. So yeah. I was, I, I recommend her to everyone. I've sent her so many clients. I've mm -hmm. sent so many clients her way because I've directly worked with her. I know her work ethic and yeah. I just think that she should get more clients. So, yeah. Uh, I did ask you how you find your clients, but you said mostly through referrals. So I think the question about um how you find your way from marketing to copywriting does it still sound valid to you yeah because actually this year the it's kind of completely changed mm. so uh, so yeah until last year it was all referrals and I realized that I actually had to invest in marketing because with referrals what was happening was some months I would be so busy with work and then some months I'd be like okay how am I going to pay rent next month mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was I made the decision to invest in marketing and it did take like a few months especially mm -hmm. because I just started on LinkedIn in February of this year yeah and yeah by April people knew how to refer me so here's the thing referrals don't necessarily need to come from previous clients it can also come from people in your network mm -hmm. and the only way people in your network can understand how to refer you is if you keep showing up on their feed and that yes. in my opinion is the importance of marketing mm -hmm. because it's only when for example I'm a copywriter okay someone follows me on LinkedIn or connects with me on LinkedIn at that moment they might not necessarily need my services mm -hmm. but a few months down the line when they're in desperate need of copywriting they'll remember that I keep showing up on their feed week after week mm -hmm. and they might either hire me or they might know who to refer me to mm -hmm. uh, so for example back in July I had just completed a discovery call with a lead and this lead came to me via referral from a previous client of mine mm -hmm. and at the end of the call so my prices are on my website and but for some reason he I don't know if he hadn't gone through my website mm -hmm. but he said that his budget was half of what I coded mm -hmm. so I told him well I would encourage you to go and look into other copywriters because my rates are market rate uh, I'm not lower or on the higher end of things mm -hmm. and well I ended the call and, and with with how most bad discovery calls go I felt really dejected I was really sad mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I go on LinkedIn and I realized there's more notifications than normal because I hadn't posted anything that day. So I wasn't mm. expecting to see new notifications. Mm -hmm. And then I see that I've been tagged three times in a post. Okay. And so the thing is, I had told this lead to go and look for other copywriters. So he went immediately after our call ended, he put a post on LinkedIn saying, I'm looking for a copywriter focused and brand with a brand strategy focus. Mm. And I've been tagged three times in that post. From other people. Yes. yes. And you know, what's the craziest part? Yeah. And I use this story all the time when I talk about marketing because my newsletter is actually marketing focused. Mm -hmm. So one only one of those people was a former client of mine. The mm -hmm. other two people hadn't worked with me. Mm -hmm. uh, the second person was someone I just exchanged a few DMs with. And I knew there was no way we were, we were working together because of the field or because of the position she was at. And yeah. the third person had never commented or engaged with a single one of my posts. Mm -hmm. But he still tagged me because he knew me as the copywriter with a brand strategy focus. Mm -hmm. And the only way these people can formulate that opinion in their minds is if they know who I am, if I keep showing up. So this year that has really changed the way I look at marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that has been super helpful. 
Yeah, that's a great point there. But marketing, when you say and showing up on social media is really important when you show up with um, a goal in mind and you show up as a professional and you show your work because something similar happened uh, to us when a colleague of ours that is doing e-commerce websites asked me, hey, do you know some brand designers that you can recommend? And I'm like, oh, oof, I have to really think about it because... I have to recommend someone that I can really guarantee that it can do the work or at least put my name behind it and say, yeah, this is a good brand designer. Take my word for it. But when it comes to that, I couldn't remember a single one because I don't remember any in my social network that has like a case study that stands out, brand identity that really speaks to a real client case, you know, um, some kind of insights that will be like, okay, this person knows what it's doing and how it's doing their job. So that's also very important when you show up, how you show up on social media. Yeah, for sure. But look, that's really good for you that you have like so many people referring you already. It's just like they do have the job for you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, So you said you are investing now more in LinkedIn. What is your idea in using LinkedIn in to like 2025 okay this is very funny because just on last friday i made the decision to shift my focus from linkedin to instagram <laughs> <laughs> yeah so here's the thing so okay. um in Walk september me through the, through the yes. brain decision behind it <laughs> all right so um I made a switch in my business in February where mm -hmm. I shut down my old website and decided to relaunch okay. because I got hold of my name domain, mariajohn.com, which oh. is absolutely crazy because mm -hmm. previously my domain was mariajohnwrites.com wow. and the old domain that was more, if it was more of a blog focus mm -hmm. and I wanted to completely shift into copywriting. Mm -hmm. So i decided to do some ICP interviews or uh, customer research. Okay. And the problem was I realized now that I, I didn't choose exactly the right people because I put the call out and I offered a free website audit in exchange. And mm -hmm. obviously a lot of people would want the free website audit without necessarily being the people who would fit my ideal mm -hmm. client profile mm -hmm. so that was a mistake that I did and mm -hmm. in October I worked with a sales coach I was in a group program for mm -hmm. sales mm -hmm. because that was a, that's a weak point in my customer flow and I repeated the same process because she told me to do this customer research and I ensured yeah. that I found the right people to interview mm -hmm. and I realized that my audience is mainly on Instagram mm -hmm. and I've and since coming on Instagram I came on Instagram like two weeks ago oh, okay. uh, since coming on Instagram I realized that it has been a lot more easier to connect with the people I want to work with mm -hmm. and with non-competing peers who can easily refer me mm -hmm. so LinkedIn is still great I'm still going to be posting on LinkedIn but it's not going to be my main focus because my problem with LinkedIn has been that lack of connect uh, essentially, it is not as easy to build a connection with people because people, even though there is now a new video feed oh and <laughs> yeah, which can which has received a lot of mixed reactions, but it has still been very difficult for me to build a connection in a way in the way I've seen it on LinkedIn on Instagram specifically, mm -hmm. especially because we found each other through threads. Yes, and that was so easy. <laughs> And you know what's surprising? I think when we connected, I had like five followers on threads. Really? But people, yes. I Now it's like 22 or something uh -huh. because I'm still so new to the platform. I think that was my third day on the platform when we connected. Wow. And yeah. So that's what I love about Instagram and mm. threads. because People are so warm and welcoming. And mm. I feel like because it allows you give people that personal look into your life through stories and through small comments you make on threads. Yeah. And I feel like that personal connection is not there on LinkedIn. So mm -hmm. LinkedIn is great. I love it. It's been great. It's been a great referral for my business, but mm -hmm. I'm looking at Instagram as a way to build a community and build more connections with people. So yeah. 
Yeah, I, I get it because Instagram, it, it has been proven to be like the most easiest way for me also to form like genuine online friendships as well. My uh, other podcast is co-hosted with uh, uh, another designer that is based in Berlin and we just met this year and we have been online friends for two years, I think, since I started freelancing. So I would completely under I get now where you go with the switch. Have you thought about TikTok as well? I'm considering finally finally after so many years <laughs> installing it in being like on the platform but have you thought about that as well so I'm, I don't think I have the brain power to <laughs> handle so many platforms Same. but eventually I, like whatever videos I've created on Instagram I probably just re-upload it to TikTok that's mm. how I'm thinking of making mm. it work Okay, okay. And what do you think about the new video features in LinkedIn? <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's let's sip the tea. <laughs> yeah, so I actually think it has slightly influenced why I want to make a shift away from LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So last week, I put out my first proper sales post. Mm -hmm. Like I put a few sales posts over... Um, the past few months but I think you can count it on like five fingers mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was at the end of it I said I'm booking for December 2024 look at my website that's my version of a sales post yeah and I just feel like I'm seeing and I feel like that decision to post that was because of what I've been seeing on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and I absolutely hated that feeling and now, this is not something everyone needs to relate to. I know a lot of people are better at pitching themselves on social media than I am. I'm very bad at it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just think that the video feed, I feel like is very, it's like the worst parts of Instagram, you know? You know that section of Instagram, which is where people are just pushing their agenda or their pitch or mm -hmm. their offer? It's just 10x on LinkedIn. Yeah. So I just don't think it's for me. The funny thing is I literally just upgraded to LinkedIn Premium. So yeah. yeah. Um I'm 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 on the two month trial, so I'm good to go for another one and a half months. Yeah. yeah. But uh I just think that it's in its in its infancy stages. So maybe mm -hmm. next year we might see a better version of it. Right yeah. now it is not for me basically is the same thing on instagram just transferred to linkedin the same analogy that you have like re-uploading from instagram to tiktok which is like yeah it's it's great for creators that don't want to you know uh, struggle with content creation but also for the viewers it's just like ah oh, this is just another recycled content you know so each audience seeks different kind of um output yes but on instagram yeah in, in the business circles you can see that where people push their agenda and their things and whatnot but also i find find it interesting that sometimes you can also learn a lot through those videos and uh, you can also see lots of real people there who don't care about all this stuff and, but, but those videos where you see like comment this word and i will send you this and all this type of I do that <laughs> uh, you do no, that I do that yeah because um that's kind of been what everyone has told me that this yeah. is how it works because you yeah. see it on other posts and yeah. they're like okay you work? should do it so no it does not <laughs> but um I like it's worked like a few times I think maybe three people but okay. when I think about how many times I've said comment or dm uh, so I kind of switch that up. I, I just tell them, look at my website or I add the link like three hours later because that's what people tell me to do. Because even though I've been on LinkedIn for more than a few months now, I still haven't figured it out for sure. And I hate that feeling of uncertainty where I'm just like, what is the algorithm telling me? I don't think there's, I don't think the algorithm has its own thing. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think that there are certain rules to follow for any algorithm, mm -hmm. but I just think that it is so different on LinkedIn because nobody actually knows what it is. Yeah. And the people who do it really well, the LinkedIn influencers, Yes. if you look, I'm, I'm just going to say this. If you look at their resume, they were unemployed or broke before they started pushing their LinkedIn offer. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think they're the right kind of people to look into because 
a lot of their advice is add three comments after you post three of your own comments to your own post really um yes and another comment another thing they talk about is they also push this dm for more info mm -hmm. uh, this really famous linkedin influencer tells when someone connects with you you should ask them why did you connect with me so or what made you think of connecting with me mm -hmm. and someone did that with me and i was just like I don't remember. I don't. Yeah. I just sent a connection request because I thought you seemed cool. But yeah. that's not something you're going to say in a LinkedIn message, right? Yeah. So I just think there's so much of this recycled garbage advice. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, it's just that it just results in a platform and an audience who doesn't know exactly what works and what doesn't. So yeah. And also it creates this kind of like, Oh, are you trying to uh, take information from me or are you trying to sell me something or are you trying to just connect with me like on a normal basis? <laughs> exactly. Which so. is like so icky and I totally understand like why why you would give up on LinkedIn honestly because I also see these three comments and I'm like yeah, there's obviously a pattern with these uh, LinkedIn gurus and what they do. One of them, he's, uh, oh, I don't even know his name. I just know he has like a blonde hair and he uses AI for all of his content. And he okay. says like, after my 10th ban, I'm now officially going on email. So if you want to learn more about my things, follow, subscribe to my new newsletter and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, it finally got to you that, <laughs> <laughs> that LinkedIn doesn't like uh, spammy uh, com uh, like content like that but and uh, inevitably other people follow and do the same thing so and now in my dms there's a person who is like uh i don't know i think they do also sales lead generation or something like that mm -hmm. and it it started like a genuine conversation and now i can see the questions like what are your current struggles in your business right now and i'm like ah. That is so sad, especially because I have tried this, you know, like I think back in May or something I was testing. I, I'm someone who's very happy to test out some new advice, yeah. although I probably shouldn't. Mm. And <laughs> I just realized it was such an awkward conversation. And even if you do get a sale at the end of it, yeah. what's the use? Because at the end of the day, people choose to work with people, not people following an automated conversation, right. especially because a lot of these influencers, they will tell you to follow up on every single one of your connections. And they'll tell you, send out 20 connection requests a day, yeah. start 30 conversations a week. And I can barely do three conversations a week. Exactly. So, and so now I've reached a point in LinkedIn where... Mm. I have just made it my mission to start up coffee chats with everyone I can. Mm -hmm. And it I even start up coffee chats with even people I don't know or people I don't think will ever work with me on mm -hmm. a client basis. Mm -hmm. Just because I realize that as my business grows, I should grow. And the only way I do that is if my network grows. And knowing how to refer other people yeah. and learning about other people is we lose that when we're solopreneurs, right? Because mm -hmm. we're working by ourselves yes. and we forget that there are people behind these profiles and businesses. Exactly. And doing these coffee chats has been so nice because I get to know so many people. Same, same. And I'm like looking at all this advice and I'm thinking, you know what? 30 DMs, 20 connection requests. This sounds so draining for me and I'm not so performance orientated. And for me, it's so much easier to have like, three connections per week and one coffee chat per week or podcast episode per week where I can get to know somebody on a like a personal base and yeah. then professional base and it's just like so much easier and authentic and genuine and I'm like so so less stressful I mean I didn't get into freelancing to stress myself out I, I yeah. quit corporate jobs just because of that so why would I do this to myself again yet in a different uh, like hamster wheel it's just like doesn't make sense exactly so I'm glad to know that you're also not on the hustle culture train which is like <laughs> bombarding us from everywhere 
And to the next question, <laughs> to, to switch up the gears a little bit, what is the weirdest request you have received to write about as a copywriter? Um, so the thing is, when I was doing blogs, I wrote so much nonsense. <laughs> so, like, I remember going from very poorly paid to mediocre pay. That step up was through a pest control company. <laughs> so I, I, I would say there's no such thing as a weird thing to write about because yeah. with every weird thing, there is an audience who wants to buy it. So nice. I would say kudos to you for having that purchasing power. Yeah. But I would say the weirdest request has been someone telling me, he was an ad agency owner and mm -hmm. He told me, I will give you the copy. You just rewrite it. Uh, and this way you can charge much lower. But the problem is you cannot rewrite copy because it is so few words, right? And yeah. you have to reflect your certain sentiment. Mm -hmm. And that same amount of research and brain work is involved to rewrite it. So it didn't make sense. And I mm -hmm. told him, no. No, but yeah, yeah. I, I would say that that's even harder to take a copy and rewrite it when it's not like based on like uh, conversations and other steps of your process, you know, so I, I think it's and when I say weird, I mean like new to you and yes. unexpected or stuff like that. But is there like a um, copywriting gig that you refuse just because it doesn't al align with your values, for example? So anything that is harmful to the environment mm -hmm. and and this specifically is in regards to crypto uh -huh. yeah i was just thinking I, about it. <laughs> i am a staunch protester of crypto mm -hmm. i it like i have gotten so the thing is this was i think right after the pandemic mm -hmm. and this was when crypto really started to gain traction yeah and so many recruiters were in my dms offering me so much money mm -hmm. and this was when I was I think this was a period where I was trying to transition also to copy and I was really broke as well yeah. and I still refused because in my like maybe for some people nfts and crypto is a good thing mm -hmm. I just do not see it as a bad as a good thing because we have lived millennia decades without crypto yeah. and it is so harmful to the environment that we can live without it so mm -hmm. for me crypto is something that I just do not work with okay okay good to know uh what is your favorite interest industries or topics you like to like for like if you like to read and write do you like to write for writers uh i love writing for coaches actually coaches oh. and design studios so mm -hmm. these are two very different audiences mm -hmm. but whenever someone asks me that i say this although dream client is a photographer mm -hmm. but with coaches and design studios the one common thing that i found with both of them is that they feel like they have to sound like everyone else in their niche and they also feel like there is no difference between them and other people in their niche. And mm -hmm. I always say that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Your story is something that it makes you different, you know, mm -hmm. even if maybe you don't have a framework. I remember a coach telling me that she she's a business coach and she told me that, oh, I don't have any framework or methodology as such. I just follow the traditional way of business coaching and I'm saying that's totally fine that is mm -hmm. something that makes you unique because yeah. there are so many business coaches who talk about these frameworks that they've developed and so yeah I would say coaches and design studios are my favorite to write for sure okay okay um what is your biggest challenge as a copywriter and how do you overcome it like do you have any story to tell <laughs> the challenge I would say I I would say it's just overcoming my own mental blocks mm -hmm. because even if I've written copy for a specific niche or industry uh, many times every time I sit down to write I always like I can feel the sweat just collecting in my armpits because I'm so nervous and I'm so anxious like yeah what if this is the one time I write badly what if this is the time mm -hmm. that the client finally says that oh, this is not good. This is the worst project that they've ever seen. They yeah. wish they hadn't hired me. So I always get these anxious thoughts. Mm -hmm. But I would say copy in itself is super easy for me. I love doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just the mental block before the start of each project. 
mm, that beginning clean slate where like where do I go how <laughs> do I start okay okay similar feeling happened to me like uh, in the first year of uh, freelancing and designing websites but I think nowadays after getting each project I'm like so invested into the project that I'm like I'm excited to start I don't have this feeling anymore of you know this it will go wrong exactly the opposite I'm like how can it get better you know so maybe uh, just try to uh, focus on the positive and like turn on that positive illusion I learned about this like from a YouTube video about dating the woman psychologist said like we focus so much on the negatives uh, in our lives like what we don't like about the person how can we reject them faster and how can we protect ourselves which is natural but if you turn on the positive illusion and try to say like what are the three things that I can say yes to in this person or this opportunity, like what it can bring me? So it's all about how it's here. That's true. Wow. I, I'm going to ask you for this video. It sounds amazing. <laughs> I have to look for it. <laughs> I will have to check my history, but for sure I will send it to you. Next question is about how did you adapt it after AI entered the scene? So... Honestly, I I think in the beginning, it was just a bit slightly difficult because it was seen as this new magic tool mm -hmm. to solve all your content problems. Yeah. But I think as business owners started using it for their own content, mm -hmm. they realized how difficult it actually is because just to input the prompt in, say, chat GPT, mm -hmm. you need to input so much of your data, like, brand voice you need to input all the information about your business yeah um and the thing is by doing all of that you might still not get the right answer or the right content or copy that you're looking for yes and the thing is like with me as a copywriter I know the right questions to ask these clients mm -hmm. to get the right answers out because I've been doing this for so long and this is like my bread and butter it's something I love doing mm -hmm. and I find that with chat GPT and with cloud and with any other uh, AI software yeah maybe not now definitely in the future they're not that sophisticated to write good enough copy for your website mm -hmm. um i just think there's so much work involved in the prompt generation that uh business owners have realized it's just easier to actually give it to the copywriter than trying to figure it out themselves uh, but i do know that kylie from real studio she's a she runs a copywriting business mm -hmm. she has come out with something called an ai copy buddy and essentially she's given you all the prompts and everything so who knows maybe that might replace a job <laughs> wow okay we have to look it up then and see how it looks like <laughs> yeah they evolve fast that's true so I, I do you use any ai tools in your work like um uh, i do in the research phase um, mm -hmm. specifically with summary so i actually have a very long process in the research phase i have mm -hmm. a uh, it's a it's a workshop that runs between three to six hours and yeah. we go into your business and we go into the offer and everything so it's really long mm -hmm. and so sometimes I will put the entire uh, transcript into like chat GPT or yeah. um, and sections because I use the free version of chat GPT yes, yes and I'll tell them like give me a summary of this so then I can make my own notes Mm -hmm. even though those notes come out to be like 22,000 words and everything so yeah yeah um yeah so that way I use chat GPT just to get the summary and mm -hmm. sometimes I will use chat GPT for my LinkedIn post so I'll write the post and then I'll put it in chat GPT and I'll be like uh is it good yeah <laughs> just for that external validation yeah. but then they'll always rewrite it so badly even though I've inputted my brand voice and everything and then I'm just like well it's okay. I, I think I figured it out. So. Yeah, yeah. It it ends up like creating more work for you rather than really exactly. <laughs> but have you personalized your profile on ChatGPT? Have you put it? What your is your field and what are your goals using ChatGPT? Because that's something I just did this year by going into my settings in my profile and tweaking it so it knows what my voice is, what I I'm doing, and what I'm going to use it for. And then when I write the prompt, I always say now. 
act as a senior UX designer or act as a professional sales coach and review this, I don't know, proposal and tell me what do you see and how do you find it like to be improved and stuff like that. So this is things that I just learned this year how to do with ChatGPT. And I'm curious, have you also done it? Yeah, I do actually have three, like, I don't know what to call it. Like, I basically call them the life coach, the LinkedIn coach, and the business coach. Mm -hmm, the so, threads. yeah, uh -huh. the threads on chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. So I have inputted a shortened version of my brand strategy document that I created for my business. Mm -hmm. uh, so the voice, the personality personality uh, about the business what I'm selling everything mm -hmm. uh, but I've also found that I like the life coach the most I suspect that is because I'm a copywriter so I know what good copy sounds like and mm -hmm. to me it always comes out wrong no matter how I input it how mm -hmm. how extensive I make the prompt engineer the life coach though is like amazing because <laughs> uh, so I have a high functioning anxiety and mm. this is a great way for me to like overcome some of the the mental blocks that I have mm -hmm. and that way I really like it but for LinkedIn and for my business I I just tell me okay tell me what's wrong with this mm -hmm. and this way I'm able to see what my minor changes I can make to the LinkedIn post or sometimes my newsletter Okay. basically like a business buddy to ask for help exactly yeah. like a sounding board of sorts yeah now when you said the life coach for the life coach part of a chat gpt have you also tried the manifestation yeah. thread? you did it's so nice did you post that thread about the manifestation uh i actually i there was someone looking for it so i i linked that the the popular thread so yes was you probably that I saw it from? I was like, yes, why wouldn't I try ChatGPT to help me manifest my dream day in a life or something? Oh, it's so nice. It's so nice. And when you press the text to speech, it's like, yeah, talk to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is this is what we should be using like AI for, just to make our lives better, even if it's like mental health and everything. So yeah. I'm a big I love manifesting. I feel like it's such a great thing to build up your mental uh, mental health, I would say, and yeah. also like your resilience. So, And if you sure. haven't tried before, I just recently from a previous guest on the podcast tried Moonly Up and I tried one of their meditation and it was so different than any other meditation I have ex ever experienced and it was so nice and it was only focused on the breathing and I was like, I'm hooked. It it was so good and so needed. So yeah, definitely another topic to talk about. If you can travel, like time travel anywhere and at any time, era or period, where and when would you go? Uh, I would say 99, 1999, mm -hmm. uh, New Year's Eve in New York, just because it was the change of the century. So I'd love to experience that feeling. Wow, such an interesting place in time with the people back then in the, that place. Imagine, imagine the buzzing and the feeling of like, this is something huge and new. Okay, I like this answer. Uh, what is your favorite meal that you indulge in? Indulge in? Yeah. Um, so it's just something that every time I go to my gran grandma's house in India mm -hmm. and she's so... Sh we're from Kerala and there's a dish called idiapam and mata curry. So idiapam is rice noodles. Uh -huh. Mata curry is like a broken egg curry. Oh. And it is, I always say if I could choose my last meal, this would be my last meal. Okay. Please send me uh, the text with the name of the dish so yes. I can look it up later. When you said egg and I was like sold <laughs> and then now I just want to know how it looks oh, like. Oh, it is, it is heavenly, just heavenly. Okay, okay. Uh, can you name something that is on your bucket list, except traveling, of course, now? <laughs> Skydiving would be one of it, for sure. You have a wish to jump from a plane? Yes, I'd love, I would love to. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch, honestly. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done, like, um, like, on, like I, I used to be on the swim teams. So I'd love to do scuba diving in okay. the Great Barrier Reef. 
but I would say I, I really have to think about my bucket list for sure but these two for okay for sure okay. skydiving uh what are you currently reading you said the outer uh, letters from a stoic by Seneca yeah that is not my usual reading I don't want people to build a perception but yeah, yeah. how do you like it do you do you find it interesting I think it's I so the thing is I had a different perception of stoicism before mm -hmm. I read this book mm -hmm. and I actually think it's great although I would say be careful of which translator you go for because every translator has a different adaptation of what Seneca is trying to say mm. so there are some translators who try to make it a little too difficult to read and then there are some translators easier to read that's such a good point that's such a good point for like philosophical readings that exactly will, either will make you like the genre or will be like oh no this is not for me yeah. okay okay which translator are you reading from and would you recommend I wouldn't recommend this translator, even though I okay. think his is the most popular, most popular translation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say to everyone, just go on Amazon and read the you you can read a sample of every book on Good. the desktop. Mm -hmm. Now you don't need to support Amazon, but you can either go to the library or buy the book or mm -hmm. well, like I do, I buy it on Kindle. Mm -hmm. So read the first few pages and see if you like the translation because for some people, maybe that's a translation that they appreciate. Mm, okay, good point. Thank you for uh, making us think about that part of reading. That's really that's really good insight. I never thought about it actually. Yeah, because I've been reading a lot of foreign authors this year, mm -hmm. especially a lot of Japanese authors. And mm -hmm. I realized that the translator matters so much when reading a foreign author's books. Because, For sure. like, think about any book or movie that you really like mm -hmm. and think about someone else's perception of that same book or movie. Even though you watch the same movie or you read the same book, you're your interpretation of it is going to be so different. And that's why the translator's role is so important. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree. And I always make that uh, comparison between uh, web designers being translators because I'm also interpreter and translator on in my spare time as a part-time job. Uh, I do it like a geek thing also. Okay. It's just like so different when you like... Uh, omit certain information or choose not to present it in a certain way or yes. choose different words so I see I see where you're coming from that's a really yeah good I and also same thing with copy because mm -hmm. especially because I'm writing the words for someone else's website so yes relate so much design and copy for sure yeah and uh, what do you want to be remembered for um I would say the same things that my friend said, which is my kindness and generosity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I've always been that kind of person and I want to keep being that kind of person because okay. I think as the years go by, you change. So that I, that is something I want to remain the same. Okay, that's a good one. And uh, questions from the audience. I think this question was one from Threads and I think one from LinkedIn, if I'm not mistaken. Can you provide some tips on proofreading before posting? Read it out loud. That uh -huh. is one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and do it like one or two days later. This is such an important part of my process mm -hmm. where I actually go it week by week. Mm -hmm. And because when you're writing something, uh, you're so in that moment and you cannot give yourself a critical viewpoint or an external viewpoint. Exactly. But when you read it a few days later or even a, the best case scenario, one week later, mm -hmm. you actually read it just as a reader would, even though you wrote it yourself. So I would say read it out loud and try to read it at least one one day later. So, mm. so you give yourself that time period where you can go back to it and be like, either cringe on it or be like, oh, this is really good. I can post it. <laughs> yes, I've noticed a big difference if mm. I write my post ahead of time, mm -hmm. just because I can tell I can know exactly what changes I should make to mm -hmm. make sure that it sounds more like me. So basically simmers a little bit and then yes. you 
in the back of your brain probably you're still thinking about that post and when you come back to it it's like you can either add or remove certain things uh, what is your process with the client and what kind of info does the client has to send that someone probably interested in copywriting asking so in terms of info that they have to send mm -hmm. so with me they only have to share like one short background questionnaire that will take them like at most 30 minutes or 45 minutes to fill out mm -hmm. if they want to go for it I always encourage them to write their hard off mm -hmm. but with me um I actually have a longer process when compared to other copywriters because I'm a very much a story first uh kind of copy uh, mm -hmm. Because I believe that people choose to work with people and not just businesses. And a lot of times when someone's coming on your website for the first time, they might be a stranger. They might have never spoken to you in the DMs. They might have just seen someone talking about you or someone referred you to them. Or mm -hmm. maybe they just saw a post of yours on social media. Yeah. When they come on their on your website, that is their first proper interaction with you. Mm -hmm. And to turn that interaction from cold to warm, mm -hmm. I think having a story first website is so important mm -hmm. because with a lot a lot of businesses can get away with having a very professional language on their website, but with solopreneurs, creator service businesses, coaching, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it requires that connection yeah. and so I have something what I call the offer positioning workshop so it's kind of like a an adaptation of the brand strategy workshop because mm -hmm. I don't think that the solo business owner or a business owner with three or four people needs a brand strategy because it's I think that is too complicated and too high level to use mm -hmm. in your business. Mm -hmm. But with an offer positioning, we're really looking into the offers. So this lasts anywhere between three to six hours. I also interview three of their previous clients. Or mm -hmm. if they're making a transition, I'll interview three of their ideal clients. Okay. And then five pages of copy and two free revisions. And that's the whole process. Oh, okay. That's nice. Thanks so much for providing uh, all this information. Now it's time for you to give your business card and tell our listeners where to find you. Well, as I already stated, I am now on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> it's Maria John Writes, which is where you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And mm -hmm. my website, mariajohn.com. And uh, I also offer a free website audit to anyone interested. It's a five minute audit and well, Nicoletta will add all the links. Yes, yes. And okay, thanks so much for your time. Have an amazing lunch and see you on the social media platforms. Bye. <laughs> bye bye.